because I feel for all of us would like to, at the end of our life, feel that we've not wasted our time. If we've developed an interest in and have some confidence in the teachings of the Lord Buddha, then to consider how we relate to experience in our experiences as brothers and as sisters in old age, sickness and death. This is where we are, brothers and sisters. Every human being we meet is our brother and sister in this experience. And how to relate in a way that brings and gives nobility and a sense of worthwhileness, a sense of worthiness to this relationship. Because the description of the relationship that a, a truly sane being, a truly mature being has with themselves and with others is given in the scriptures that we are so lucky to have some confidence in. And if you're here, you must at some point have some confidence in the Lord Buddha. And in the scriptures, there's the description of how a, a truly mature, a truly sane being relates is given and it describes the relationship to four qualities which I have no no but I hope that you've heard of Meta Karuna Mudita Unupeka. Have you heard of those? They're, these are the qualities that are expressions of true maturity and true sanity. And when we dwell in those there's a sense of I shall dwell spreading metta in all directions, in all things. I shall dwell spreading karuna in all directions to all things. And I shall dwell spreading mudita in all directions to all things, up, down, round, all about, abundant, limitless. And similarly with upeka. Because this is the natural expression so how to do this? Because this is a description of how an enlightened being acts. It's not an instruction. It's a description of a natural expression of enlightenment. I find that helpful. Mm. Well, that's how I interpret it. I, I may well be wrong. But what does it actually mean? In practice, and then how to relate to this experience of old age, sickness, death, association with the dislike, separation from the light, being irritated, not getting what one wants, the experience of humanity, to how to relate to it in a way that does give nobility and worthiness to life. I do feel it's clear in the scriptures and there is something that we can do so the first thing is in this relationship to what we all experience the irritations the upsets the troubles the noble way to relate to this is to understand it the way that we often try to relate to it is try to gloss it over by seeking some distraction and pretend that it's not there. And this is called karma sukhali kan yoga. It's linking ourselves to things that are just distractions and actually in some way harming and in some way um, self-harming. Strangely enough, 
indulging in something, you think that you're giving yourself a treat sometimes. Um, but often it, it's actually a type of self-harming. You know, the, the extreme self-harming is the other one, which is, I'm not going to do this. I've got control. I'm going to be able to just uh, struggle and get there. And that's, that one can notice is self-harming. But because it's actually a shutting down and a desensitizing and it's not going to work. It's not going to be profitable. Whereas indulging in something is a different type of self-harming. It's a distracting and uh, a desensitizing again. And uh, it's less alive actually, because it's persisting in practicing ignorance. Because ignorance is a verb. It's something that we do. And the difficulty with ignorance is that if we don't know that we're doing it, that's true ignorance. Yeah? We don't know what we don't know. And the depths of that not knowing, we don't know. <laughs> And of course, if we don't know and we don't understand something, and certainly if we don't understand this human condition, and if I don't understand something, the chances are that I'm going to make mistakes. Yes? If I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to make mistakes. And making the mistake in life is what we are doing when we generate a sense of compulsion about what we have to do. We have to get something, we have to get rid of something, or we just have to become something more, or stop something. Yeah? This is the compulsion of ignorance. And this is tanha, the compulsion of ignorance, the thirst that is driving. And that is this is the, the response to that, which is not noble, is of course indulging it. But the response that's noble is abandoning it. This is something that can be abandoned. And the way of abandoning, it begins actually with generosity. It begins with generosity. Because when there's a practice of generosity, I feel there's a practice of generosity, there's a sense I can give something. And if I can give something, then in that moment I feel satisfied because I feel I have enough. If I can't give something, then I feel either I have to get something or I have to protect myself because I can't stand it, which is the response of greed and hatred. Yeah? Whereas in giving, at that moment, we let go a bit of our self-centeredness and self-concern. And we recognize at that moment a sense of connection that is, that is deeper. And the person that you most need to give to and what you can really give to this one is care and attention. Yeah? That's what you can do. And uh, feeling that you can do it, this is something I can do. And this is a road to success. This is an aspiration in the sense of I can do this. This is the other form of impulse to do something, which is chanda, which is, in the sense, the impulse of being able to give, or to give energy. Chanda, virya, chitta vimangsa is the road to the success. So this giving is the way, one of the ways to abandon tanha, which is noble. The relationship to tanha is to abandon it. Now, 
the next two steps in the path, of course, are Niroda and Maga, ways of relating nobly. They're called the nobling truths or the ennobling truths or the ones that make life worthwhile. These are truths that make life worthwhile. They give it some value. It's the life stops being a curse and begins to be a blessing for oneself and for others. When these relationships are perfect and perfected and in tune with the Dhamma, then the life is worthwhile. So, what to do? And the, the to do is to practice. The to do is to practice. And what we can practice is the Eightfold Path. And the practice being, one of the things about practicing is you have to keep doing it <laughs> until you get it right. And the business of this is if you think you never make mistakes, you're incredibly stupid. If you don't learn from your mistakes, also a tiny bit stupid, or maybe more than stupid. If you learn from your mistakes, then of course you're starting to begin to practice. You know, acknowledging your mistakes, acknowledging your error is always, always considered beneficial. If you've made a mistake, acknowledge it. If you've done something, then acknowledge it. And then in acknowledging a mistake, you can then learn and you can keep practicing, keep practicing. So acknowledging your mistakes in your practice of the Eightfold Path is helpful because it's a practice. The thing is, a lot of us relate to the teachings maybe a little bit clever. We think, well, all I need to do is to understand the Eightfold Path. Oh, I understand how it works. Okay, this is fine. <laughs> but that's actually not going to... No, this is a pretty path. Okay. But it doesn't actually do anything unless you practice it. The noble way to relate to the Eightfold Path is to practice it, practice it, practice it, and acknowledge your mistakes. You know, because you've got a lot to practice, <laughs> and just enough to practice. And uh, what you can also do if you're really clever, starting to get really clever, is to learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> That's called educating yourself. Because many people have made mistakes and if they've acknowledged them, then one is able to learn from them. And that's, you know, that's our legacy. You can learn from people, learn from other people's mistakes. But keep learning and acknowledge that, you know, if, and if you don't know that you've made a mistake, that's also interesting. Because that's again a perpetuation of ignorance. Yeah? Because ignorance is then it's something you're doing. I'm not knowing that I've made a mistake. And then if you don't know that you've made a mistake, then you're likely to repeat it or you're likely to not even notice it. This is human behavior. So making life worthwhile, giving life value, practice the Eightfold Path and realize the end of suffering. Make it real. Make it something that is actual in your lives, your own life and the lives of others. And your life then is more of a blessing as best you can. And there's the manifestation of this, as I mentioned, is this 
metta, which is absolutely necessary for human life, not dwelling in aversion, is necessary for human lives. If your mother, when you were born, noticed how much trouble this thing was going to be, and, st <laughs> and started to dwell in aversion to the work that was going to be necessary. <laughs> and you didn't receive an incredible amount of kindness, an incredible amount of generosity, you wouldn't have the opportunity to be alive as a human being. The human society is dependent upon kindness, absolutely dependent upon kindness. Otherwise, forget it. And actually, for the most part, human beings are kind, good enough. You know, on the whole, most human beings are not out to get you. You know, they've got issues, but on the whole, most human beings are perfectly fine most of the time, and they recognize kindness. Actually, and they work with kindness. There's a certain amount of trust that's necessary even driving down the road. Not every person on the road is out to kill you. <laughs> They're actually just trying to get from one place to the other and be as kind as they can, as best they can on the whole. Most of the people you meet on the street are fine most of the time. And to acknowledge that is really helpful. I feel, because it helps oneself, myself, not dwell in aversion to everybody. And not dwelling in aversion is what metta is about. It's a sense of, I can accept this. Yeah? I'm not trying to push this away. And, uh, you know, it's actually the natural state of a heart that's free from confusion. Because actually, even if things are really, really terrible, you can accept it. You know the story of the Tibetan who was locked up and tortured by the Chinese? And he said his greatest fear was that he was going to hate his jailers and his torturers. You know, because he recognized that it would hurt him more. You know, that's a good story. You know, if you recognize that sort of opportunity, and then the next thing that's really necessary for humans to exist is the action that is about reducing suffering now and in the future. An action that reduces suffering now and in the future is compassion. Karuna is about doing something, making something, finding a structure whereby beings suffer less now and in the future. That's what Karuna, I feel, is about. That's my explanation of Karuna. Metta, not dwelling in aversion, is radiant, it's accepting and it's attractive. Karuna is about making space, making structures, doing stuff that help people suffer less now and in the future. And your parents needed to do that to you. You need to do it to yourself so that you suffer less now and in the future. And that's something that you can figure out because what it requires is figuring it out. Karuna doesn't work without wisdom. Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise it's called meddling. Because you do stuff, but you don't know whether it's going to work or not. It requires wisdom. You know, it's the two wings that make the thing fly. Of course, the perfect example of this is in Lord Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who was perfect in compassion and understanding. What he offered us was the Dharma Vinaya. He offered a way of explaining to ourselves explaining to others that, you know, a structure of thought, a structure of approach, a way of 
relating to life internally with the Dhamma and then externally with the Vinaya. This is how you can relate to people in a way that will make less suffering for yourself and for others. You know, the basic Vinaya of humans is the five precepts, as you know, because human society relies on the five precepts. That's why all the laws are around how much you can drink, how much, how much drugs you can take, because that affects the rest of it. Yeah? Because that affects how likely you are to lie, to misuse your sexuality, to steal or to kill. All the laws are around that. And what humans can do is practice the incredible generosity of offering fearlessness to themselves and to others. Because if you train using the five precepts, then no being needs to fear you. Yeah? And if you're confident that that's what you're doing because you're conscious, you say to yourself, I will train to practice the five precepts, then when you relate to people, you know that you're offering them fearlessness. They don't need to fear you. And so you can stand a bit stronger. <laughs> yeah? You're not trying to impose anything on them, but you don't need to back down because they don't need to be frightened of you. So you don't need to actually fear them. Because the worst that can happen to you is they can kill you and strangle you and do terrible things to you. But you've not harmed them, so your karma is fine. <laughs> you know, that's why I encourage vegetarianism. Not for the sake of the animals, but for the sake of the humans that are involved in such an industry. Because that's an industry that is involved with fear. And that's not kind to the humans involved. Sorry. That's why I encourage it. But I'm not incredibly fussy about it, and I'm not precious about it, and I don't try to impose upon it. Because um, accepting generosity is also beautiful, and any impulse to share is to be encouraged. So I'm not rabid about it. I don't get frothy about it. But if people ask about then that's the, what I say. I, I encourage it. Not for the sake of the animals, because the animals aren't making bad karma, but for the sake of the humans who are involved in a strange relationship with life. But, you know, you all need to put rice on the table. And perfect livelihood is really, really difficult. Really only Arahants have perfect livelihood. The rest of us are slightly muddled. But knowing we're slightly muddled is really helps. The other thing that I talk about is joy, the place of joy, because that is really lovely. Bringing joy to situations really helps. Appreciation, joy, a sense of wishing to rise up to something, a sense of, yeah, if he's doing something beautiful or she's doing something beautiful, I can help that, I can support that, I can rise up and do that myself. That is mudita. And just the appreciation that parents have for their kids, you know, when the baby first smiles, when the first time they bring home some success, I say to, to parents, you know, it's not your responsibility to make your children happy and it's not your children's responsibility to make you happy. If you tell your children, if you do that, then I'll be happy, <laughs> you're making your children responsible for your happiness. <laughs> That's not fair, is it? <laughs> You can be happy if they do have success and do things, but if you make them responsible for your happiness, 
That's weird. But we do, don't we? Because we tell our kids, if you do that, then I'll be happy. Yeah? And then they're not responsible for your happiness, but you're not responsible for their happiness either. Their happiness is their responsibility. Your responsibility as parents is to help them suffer less now and in the future. Give them structures, do things, so that they can suffer less now and in the future. Whether they're happy or not, not your business. And it's the same, actually, with teachers and pupils. It's not my responsibility <laughs> to make sure that you're enlightened, even if I wish you were. <laughs> but <laughs> I just do the best I can. Yeah? And it's not your responsibility to make me happy either. So whether you understand or not is it's my business. Okay? Because in the end, these things, it belongs to nature. How things work out will be according to nature, according to their own nature. Things will work out as they work out. This is called Upeka. Upeka is sensitive stillness, which makes no distinction. It's called sometimes serenity. It overlooks the other four. So when it's possible to experience joy, joy is experienced. Appreciation for the space, for the time, for you listening to me is something I can experience joy for. Yeah? And then if I can, I can do something to help receive suffering now and in the future, offer you something that maybe will help, and not dwell in aversion to the situation or to how things are. That's a way of practice. So we can practice the Eightfold Path, realize the end of suffering, know where dukkha ends, make that something real, know what's not thinking. Which is not personal. I drop that in at the end because I think it's important to notice the end of suffering. Make that something that's real. Know what's not thinking, that's not making anything extra about the past or the future or even the present. Because this is how it is right now. And this is how we can be right now. We can understand dukkha. We can abandon the causes of dukkha. We can realize the cessation of dukkha. And we can practice the path now. I offer that for your consideration this evening. And if it's of any use, please use it. If it's not, then leave it behind and just say, this guy's talking rubbish. It's all right. I don't mind. If it's of any help, then please take what is helpful. If it's not, then leave it behind. Thank you all and I'll open for questions. Mahasadhu Ajahn. So we open to the floor for any questions for Ajahn. Ajahn, my name is Frank Wong. This is the first time I've met a direct student of Ajahn Chah. So may I ask some questions regarding Ajahn Chah? You can try. <laughs> Okay, from what we have read, Rajan Chah was very ill during the last 10 years of his life. So my question was, during the time when he was sick, was he able to observe the Vinaya? Yes. Short answer, yes. Actually, the reason I was asking this is because I have just recovered from a bad flu after five days. And during that time, I find it very difficult to meditate, to stop eating after midday, or even to read the Dharma. So Ajahn Chao was able to do that during the last 10 years of his life, to observe the full Vinaya, despite being gravely ill. No, he wasn't, he wasn't eating in the evening, wasn't taking food in the evening. 
He might have taken intravenous stuff, but that doesn't count in terms of eating food. There is no being that needs your metta, your karuna, your mudita, more, your upeka, more than the being you live with 24 hours a day, more than you yourself. So be incredibly kind. Umpo Cha had five people looking after him 24 hours a day for 10 years. You didn't have that. So be kind. <laughs> yeah? He had a lot of support. You don't have that support. So be kind and do what you can. Have chicken soup. Apamacham, whatever. Okay, I have one you. question about the vegetarian business. Yeah. Yes. I'm very curious because until today, no Bhante gave me a definite answer. Is Buddha a vegetarian? Uh, yes or no? The Lord Buddha said there were a few things that the monks shouldn't eat. He deliberately did not insist that all his monks were vegetarian. Okay? He deliberately did not insist that. He did not insist on vegetarianism. That was what his cousin insisted upon as a way of making it very strict. The Lord Buddha himself, I don't think that he really made much of an issue about things. The thing was that if something has been killed especially for you, then a monk should refuse it. So if you say, well, I'm going fishing tomorrow, Bhante, I'll bring you back some fish and some crab, then the monk should say, no, I'm sorry, I can't eat that. Okay? Because that would have been brought back especially for one. Yeah? Or if I'm staying with somebody who's got chickens and they have a cockerel and they say, tomorrow I'll give you some of my best eggs, then those are fertilized eggs. So technically, the monk should refuse them because they would have been killed especially for and the monk would know that. But if you're walking past somebody's house and they happen to have cooked something which has eggs or meat in it or fish in it and they want to share some with you, there's no offense for the monks to receive it. And the Buddha probably received all sorts of things like that. Receiving something is different from actually eating it. And the Buddha said you don't have to eat everything in your bowl. Unlike your grandmother who said, if you leave some grains of rice in your bowl, you're going to get terrible acne. The Buddha didn't say, you have to eat everything. The Buddha said, eat the things that are good for you. Okay? So, that's the balance. Does that help a bit?